Hi, Holly. Thank you so much for being with me today. Hi, Reese. Good to see you. We are going to get up and move a little bit today. This is something I think we all need to kick off our year doing. Um, I think we've been sedentary enough. Yes. <laughs> and as we know, we could, that, that has actually very serious consequences. Absolutely. Um, but before we kind of get into you know, the basics of stretching yoga and all that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you even came to becoming a yoga teacher and wellness coach. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. Back in, let's say about 2006 or so, I was in an airport flying to my sister's house in Vegas at the time, and I picked up a yoga journal magazine. And at that point, I'm like, oh, this looks kind of interesting. And I, you know, I had taken yoga classes at the gym and things like that in the past, but um, I started flipping through it and some words were popping out at me and, and I just kind of wrote them down. And one of them was Ayurveda. And then, you know, there were a bunch of other things. So when I got back home, I started researching Ayurveda and went, oh my gosh, why haven't I heard of this before? Um, so I went down that it's rabbit pretty amazing, hole. right? Oh, it's fantastic. And then I started taking more yoga classes and then, which turned into in 2008, I ended up getting certified and, and here we are. I, in the meantime, I've created a yoga teacher training program. I had a yoga studio for six years before COVID um, and now I'm doing stuff online. So it's, it's evolved for sure. Wow. Um, I, do, I know that you've had some setbacks, some health setbacks mm -hmm. that's also kind of made you really dive into the wellness world. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, for very I, personal reasons. Yeah, in um, around 1992 or so, I was hiking in Yosemite and I got bit by a tick. And for, I'm going to say in air quotes, fortunately, um, I had the indicative bullseye rash that comes along with Lyme disease. Uh, not everybody has that rash, so it makes diagnosis pretty challenging for a lot of people. Um, so I feel lucky in that regard. 1992? That I, yeah. Yeah. 92, 93. Yeah, you know, and Lyme was really new on the scene back then, and especially on the West Coast, which is where I'm at. And, um, you know, the doctor saw the rash, and he's like, this looks like a Lyme rash. Uh, I'm not sure if it's Lyme disease, but we're going to treat it like it is. And, and back in the day, the treatment is way different than it is now. Um, so he threw, you know, like a week or 10 days worth of antibiotics at me, and then some topical antibiotics, and was like, okay, when that's done, you're healed. Great. So my brain was like, okay, this is a non-issue until decades later, every, you know, about once a decade or so, I get a big flare up. And, and I think it was 2004, I was really sick and it was scary. I mean, I had friends who were looking at me like, oh my gosh, is she going to die? I mean, seriously, I had a friend who was worried that I was going to die. Um, it was, it was really bad. Um, and I called it my mystery illness at the time. You know, the, the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on test after test after test. Nothing was conclusive enough. Um, and then it kind of passed. So um, this last flare that I had, it, the years kind of blur together. But I'm going to say it was maybe around 2018, uh, something like that. Um, Pre-pandemic for sure. Uh, I had another flare come up. And, you know, at that point I was feeling like I was in my 90s. And, and I was in my 50s. <laughs> And so it was, well, actually at that point I would have been 48, um, but still. And so, you know, it was, it was dramatic. Um, and then I started researching and realized, oh, this doesn't really go away. And no wonder I don't feel great. So what's made me feel better though, is getting flipped, like just changing pretty much everything. And it, it wasn't like at the time that I was, I wasn't eating a bunch of junk. I wasn't drinking a bunch of junk. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't living like a monastic lifestyle. But I wasn't, you know, hitting McDonald's every day or ever, actually, you know. So right. <laughs> um, once I really kind of cleaned things up a bit, it, things changed. And then adding in the movement daily. And, and that varies. Some days I have a, a nice walk kind of hike in me. And other days it's just stretching on the floor. But something, you know, is getting some movement in. So that's where, you know, I, I really feel like every person on the planet should be doing this. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And it's true, just like you said, right? Yeah. You mix it up, you do what feels well, you know, feels right for you mm -hmm. that day. But it should be every single day, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it needs to change, though, you know, because with my Lyme disease, I have fibromyalgia. But at one point, they diagnosed me with MS, they were suspecting lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, like all the things 
I'm like, well, no wonder I don't feel great if I'm having some of these markers pop up in my lab work, you know? Um, so I've had to get creative with self-care because some days I just, it just doesn't feel good. Not, not even feel good. Like, Oh, this feels good. It's just, Oh, this hurts. So, you know, right. I've, I've had to get creative within myself and my movement options. Um, and that's where I feel like I bring something kind of different and unique to the table for, for people who take my class, because I've lived in a pain body sometimes more than others that I've learned how to really uh, modify the movements to get creative with options and things. And so I, I offer that in my classes. That's so great. That's so, so great. So it's not necessarily, you know, teaching all the yogis and the people who've been doing yoga for like, you know, 20, 30 years, yeah. but it's really kind of, I feel like you really bring things movement to the basics, right? Absolutely. And, the and, core of and, and empower people to listen to their bodies. And so just because I can say, Hey, textbook something that this is the way that is going to keep your body safe. There's always caveats to that. You know, if so, let's say if I'm saying, Hey, take your arms, you know, out and up and bring your arms up overhead. If somebody has, you know, a rotator cuff injury that they're not going to do that, nor should they. So I'm always telling people, you know, adjust you in, in the arms up overhead example, someone could take their arms forward or just not and do one arm kind of a thing and, and have them know that's okay. It doesn't have to be this, you know, all or nothing kind of mentality with, with movement. But I think, I feel like it should be something, right? Cause if you do nothing for too long, then, you know, it locks up forever <laughs> or it just becomes more and more difficult to move that muscle, whatever it may be. Absolutely. And you know, you had recently a guest on who was talking about myofascial release and, and the fascia system in general. And, and so if people haven't watched that, they should go back and watch that too, because it, it really adds a great bit of knowledge to understanding why we, we get tight, you know, we're like, Oh, I'm stiff. I'm sore. It's so much of it is, is a fascia situation, you know? So when you get the daily movement, when you get some daily self massage in and these kind of a things, it just overall helps with our wellness. And I like to think of it as like, you know, we, we're oiling the Tin Man, you know, in the Wizard of Oz and you're like, you know, and all of a sudden like the, there you go, the movement happens, but um, it's that. So even if one day all the movement that we can do is taking our hands and just doing a self massage, that's something. It doesn't have to be you're running a marathon that day, you know? Right, right. Which I think a lot of people probably watching this is are very relieved <laughs> that they don't feel like they have to train for that marathon or whatever. Right. Um, so, so what are some of the basic, I know you do like a gentle stretching class mm -hmm. and you do different kinds of movement class and you do your yoga class and um, I'm sure it varies in terms of um, degrees of, you know, whether it's mobility or whether it's, you know, just advanced um technique or whatever right. it may be but what are some of the kind of rudimentary general things that you feel like would be good for one's body to be doing on a daily basis maybe even kind of a step before that are there some kind of foundational elements that i feel like i'm not going to say everybody because that's really broad so there's always going to be somebody that this is not going to apply to so before i even say anything i just want to clarify i'm not a doctor and so if your doctor has said something that you're going to listen to the doctor, like I am not, I don't have, I have a good education. I don't have that education. So that being said, um, certain things, whether you're sitting, like I'm sitting on the ground right now, but if you're even standing, doing the dishes or brushing your teeth, if we always kind of check at the, the area that's closest to the ground. So in my case, sitting on the floor right now, I'm going to check my pelvis and optimally I'm going for it to be like a bowl and not a pouring bowl and not a wonky you know weight on one side or the other so there's that part of it so you can do that when you're sitting either in your chair on the floor or even when you're standing brushing your teeth a lot of people like my default setting in my body is my pelvis tilts forward my rib cage thrusts forward and my back arches like this that's just how my body has done for decades at this point so I'm constantly trying to come to just neutral, which that's where my bones are going to be aligned properly. My spine, especially the muscles within everything's going to be functioning the way that they're designed to. 
But if we do stuff like using me as the example where, I'll kind of come here for a second, like if I'm, you know, sticking my butt out, my chest forward, and just standing there like that, my hip flexors are stretching longer, my back muscles are tightening, muscles are doing things that they're not really designed to be doing most effectively. So then that creates a whole bunch of problems. So um, starting at the base. Especially when you do them for years upon years. Right. When it's our, when it's our, our pattern, just the place, the way to stand. You know, the next time you're doing the dishes, not you, but anybody watching, how, how do you stand? Are you putting more weight on one foot? Are you tilting a hip? You know, what, what's happening? And these things just create muscle patterns in the body, which can cause issues down the road. So when we do a stretching practice, we're trying to go for that, trying to bring as much balance and symmetry into the actions as possible to kind of make up for what we do when we're not stretching, you know? So that's a good place to start is at the how, pelvic. How do we correct those habits? It's, it's really being mindful and just observing, you know? Noticing, I mean, I my right leg tends to externally rotate, meaning like point out. So if you look at me, when I walk, my right foot is kind of popping out a little bit more. So little things I try to kind of correct. Some things you can't. It could be the way my bones are, you know, formed, in which case that's not going to be corrected no matter how much I keep, you know, trying to make it happen. There's So there's certain limitations. Um, but if it's like a muscular or a habitual pattern type of a thing, we can absolutely make the shifts. It's just being aware and going, oh, I'm doing that thing again. <laughs> and then just trying to not and and when we find those patterns that we do don't get upset with yourself it's not a frustration level you know I look at it as like I'm reprogramming decades of of movement issues that I've had through the years um, so it's not going to correct overnight so um, right exactly starting at the pelvis is great then going into the rib cage a lot of times we kind of if you think of the rib cage as I'm, a, I'm an analogy person, but sometimes the ribs just kind of push forward. So if you think of taking like your lower front rib cage and pulling it in, it's not a rounding of the back. It's just you're not pushing your chest forward. You're not rounding it too far back. It's that middle place. So then the spine is longer. And when you do that, you'll feel that your front abdominal muscles and then other core muscles automatically kind of fire up a little bit just because they're stabilizing, which is what they're supposed to do. And then speaking of the core muscles, you know, I, I was a child of the 80s and, you know, back in the day it was like, you know, abs of steel and all of these things, you know, these videos and stuff, yeah. um, <laughs> right? Remember those? Like yeah, Kathy totally. Smith or whoever it was doing it. I rocked that in my family Even room. Even Jane Fonda and all that, yeah. Right, exactly. And, you know, things have changed a lot. Like I absolutely do do not subscribe to the no pain, no gain philosophy of the, the back, you know, in those days, not even close. If it hurts, you stop like end of discussion, you know, um, in my opinion. But, um, so the core muscles, you know, we, I, I was tending to think it was more just like front abdominal muscles, but it's way more complex than that. And so when we have a strong core, it's the front abdominals, keeping it super simple, the side rib cage muscles kind of going in, your back, low back muscles going in. So if you think of just those as kind of, it's, it'd be like if you're wearing a, a, a corset or a girdle or mm -hmm. like a, a back support compression-y kind of belt thing. It's that, it, it just kind of hugs in. It's not like you're, you know, tightening up Scarlett O'Hara, you know, can't breathe kind of a thing in a corset. It's not that. It's just a gentle everything going in. And then depending on um, the source, you'll hear that the core muscles can also include your quads, so your top thigh muscles, also your glutes, your buttocks muscles. So there's a lot. It's not certainly not the front abdominals um, specifically and, and, and only. Um, but so core involvement is really important too. You know, getting in and out of bed, getting up and down off the toilet, you know, all of these things in and out of your car. If you're using your core and you're moving with awareness, you're way less likely to get injured. I mean, how many times, you know, do people get hurt just doing the most mundane things? Just, right. you know. Especially as we get older. Exactly. I mean, about five years ago, 
I was bending down to pick up a trash bag and I tore my meniscus. You know, it's just like the little, I'm like, what? So, right. you know. So what do we do then? I mean, I feel like we really do need to be more conscious because we, you know, we, we tend to react in crisis, right? right? And then we're in crisis mode trying to fix something that could have been preventative. And I am a huge advocate of, you know, just trying to prevent things from falling apart and right. that there are little things that we can do every day yes. um, to just maintain our strength or maintain, uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm guilty of a lot of those things, you know, I'm hunched over my computer for a lot of the day right. and, you know, my posture has been affected because of it, you know, um, like if you, if you even look, you know, this is so weird, but I don't know if you can even tell, but so these two fingers have started to curve because of my mouse. Oh yeah. Which is insane to me. Right. But it's total and because it's fine on this hand and it was causing me pain. Um, now I take CBD for it, but right. Um, and but you know, yeah, but then you really do see that structurally what is happening to the rest of my body if I can see it in my hands. Right. And is like what a gift for you to be able to see that and and to be able to like you can nip that right now. You know what I mean? And doing especially if you have like a CBD lotion or oil you can be working on the fascia there, you know, and just you're sitting watching TV or whatever at night and just stretch it out and massage and get in there. That, that sh if you catch stuff early enough, a lot of times it can be undone, you know, so that'll right. probably be okay d d for you probably doing some flat handed stuff on the ground, like a, like a tabletop or a down. Yeah. I'm constantly dog. now stretching. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, exactly. but for everybody else, I mean, I honestly, I start out my mornings even before I get out of bed and I stretch in bed and it's, it's a, just that alone is such a game changer because, you know, oftentimes I'm, you know, waking up, I'm like, Oh, I got to pee. And I'm just like boinging out of bed and my body's like, Whoa, hold on. You know, it's, <laughs> I've been laying down for however many hours, you know? And so now it's get, you know, circling my ankles around my wrists, taking my arms, you know, laying down still and just stretching back, crossing my legs, um, doing some gentle twists and having pillows underneath my legs to help support. I'll, I'll show that in a second. Um, but just doing some soft movements, even before you take off the covers in the morning is a fantastic thing. Right That's there. such a great idea. I always naturally, for whatever reason, I do child's pose. Uh -huh. before I, I actually get out of bed. Yes. And just like kind of stretch out like this. And Absolutely. my husband thinks it's really funny. <laughs> like, no. I don't know. I just been doing it for years and I just, yeah. it just is innate now, you know, it feels great. Um, and you know, and it's, that's a nice stretch for your hip flexors and for your low back. But you know, there's a lot of people that can't do child's pose, even if they're warmed up for two hours, you know, doing stretching and stuff because it's not accessible for their bodies, whether it's like, knee issues or, or whatever, but that's really the common thing is the knee issues. Um, I do child's pose in bed too. Um, cause it feels so good. It's just, but, but again, it's not gonna feel good for everybody. So that's the thing is like, sir, right. there's, I'll show to in a, in a minute, some, my go-to stretches that I do in almost every class, but just because they're really passive does still doesn't mean that everybody can do them. So there's always going to be limitations for sure. Um, but do you want me to show you a couple of my and favorites? And what, what would you say? So what are some of the, like the benefits of stretching before you kind of, before you get out of bed or before you do really anything? I mean, it helps get the blood circulation going. It gets oxygen to the muscles, which is fantastic. You know, we want that. It helps with mobility, range of motion, um, can, you know, lubricate your joints some, get the synovial fluid going through your body. And it just feels good. You know, at that point when it, Okay, I shouldn't say that. It may not always feel good to people, but it, in theory, I would encourage people to be doing movements in the morning before getting out of bed that aren't too intense. Like I want you to be like, oh, this is really nice and not, you know, oof, uh, I feel so stiff, you know, so. But I do believe though that it's, it's kind of like this catch 22, right? Because the more you stretch, the more it's going to feel good. The less you stretch, it's just going to start to become more painful because right. your muscles don't even know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, stretching feels good when you stretch a lot. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. So. And it's, and it's the same principles with all movement, you know, but 
and I know for me within my body, I mean, what prevents me from working out more intensely, which I know my body would benefit from. I absolutely know that, but it hurts. And so if something's hurting, who wants to do that? And yet, so it's, it's finding that balance. And again, working with CBD is a, is a great bridge for sure to help with the pain management. Um, especially if, you know, it's taken like before movements are happening, like more intense movements. Um, but you know, do, right. Doing exactly. It, Cause it's bringing down the inflammation. Exactly. So doing, doing the movement is going to help make the movement not hurt in the future, but sometimes it hurts until you get to the point where it's not hurting. So it's like you said, it's a catch 22. It's, it's challenging, but that's where I feel like really passive stretches especially first thing in the morning, you know, first thing when, before you're out of bed, then a little bit more stretching after you've kind of woken your body up a bit. And then right before you go to bed at night. And I'm not talking an hour long session. This, you know, in total, it could equal 15 minutes if you wanted it to, you know, like for all three. Um, but yeah, the, the benefits are fantastic. I mean, you just, it feels better to not feel so tight and locked up. I mean, we all know how that feels. You know, if you get a massage and you're kind of melting off the table and you're like, oh, I feel so good right now. I mean, that's what we want for our whole day, every day. Right. So that's what we're going for. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awareness and then the stretching. So why don't you show us some of your basic stretches? Okay. I will for sure. And, and also a lot of um, the same principles can happen sitting up in a chair. So folks can't get up and down off a floor. You know, these things that I'm going to show can be done in bed too. It has a different dynamic if it's in bed just because, you know, it's not a, a flat, hard surface. So it's, it's softer for sure. Um, so both have, you know, both have benefits. Um, okay, I'm going to scooch back a little bit. So twisting, doing a twist is phenomenal for the body. And as, you know, people in society right now, we don't really do, do them very often. So even before like showing this, like one way, this, this is kind of a silly hack, but a way to get more twists in your life is if you take off your toilet paper roll from the holder and you put it on the tank behind you. So each time you go to use toilet paper, which depending on the person may be different times during the day, you're going to be turning around to grab it. And then when you go to put it back, turn back around the other way. So you're getting twists in without like doing exercise type stuff. So that's just a, a, a fun little thing. But, um, if you're like me, I that's think that's awesome. I know like it's silly, but, but with twists, but practical, but it's true. Like if you incorporate practical movement that you're going to be doing anyway, yeah. that's going to be good for your body and enhance, you know, and it hopefully extend some of your movement. Why not? Right? Exactly. Because if, if our spine is, you know, if we have spinal issues, that just messes up the whole thing. Our life, our quality of life is dramatically impacted by spinal health and or lack thereof, whether it's the actual spine or the muscles surrounding the spine, you know, it's, it's such a, such a major obvious component to our health. So keeping spinal health is, is really, really important. So when you're doing twists and this is, you know, if somebody has bulging discs, um, or any sort of, you know, osteoporosis or, or any other spinal condition where your doctor is saying, Hey, don't do certain movements. You're going to ignore what I'm saying right now. So with that little disclaimer right there for everybody else, if you think of keeping your spine stacked straight up, um, like when you're little kids and you do building blocks and they just get stacked one on top of each other, if one is off kilter a bit, then it's, it's wonky. So we're doing the same principle. So using the philosophy that I talked about a bit ago with the pelvis being neutral and a bowl. So the pelvis is neutral. My ribs are in my core is activated. And then I'm going to keep my ears stacking over my shoulders. And what that does is it prevents the chin from pushing forward because now you're doing this with your neck, right? So we're trying to keep the ears over the shoulders. I like to say, Imagine you're a puppet being pulled up by your strings and the strings are attached to the tops of your ears. So if you really lengthen there, that keeps your chin parallel to the ground. And then another cue that I give a lot and it's pretty effective is if you imagine that I have my hand and I put it at the back of your head 
and then you push your head into my invisible hand, that sets up really good form that in theory should keep most people's spine pretty happy. So then when we start from there, then you can do, you know, if you want to do something with your arms, you don't have to, but let's say you start with your hands here and you can just twist and take a hand down. I'm going to turn sideways for a second. So when you're twisting, sitting up, you just want to make sure that you're not leaning back, right? So I, even though my hand can be flat and that's going to depend on people because of the length of their arms and their torsos. But so I'll have just keep the pads of my fingers on the floor, my elbows bent, and I keep my hand kind of close to my body rather than this. So spine is up, ribs are in, lifting through the tops of the ears. And then coming out, you'll engage your core a little bit more and then slowly untwist and come back to that center position and then just do the same thing on the other side. So there's some... Um, Kind of, kind of good little cues in there to help keep your body happy while you're doing a seated twist. Um, Do you recommend a number of seconds that people should be doing that for, or the number of times, or just until no. it feels? Yeah, I, I don't, right. I don't think it it needs to be super specific like that. Um, really, it's I the way I teach in my classes is we'll hold stuff for a bit, so it wouldn't be uncommon for me to be in a twist like this for you know. A minute which seems when I say a minute that's like oh just a minute but when you're sitting holding something like this it's it's longer than you think um, and then like I said the key is to just use the core to come out to help that just kind of gives everything a nice little hug supporting the spine a little bit more so it's really a matter of just doing it you still should be able to breathe easily when you're in the chest um, in your twist the chest will kind of uh, sorry the breath will land in the upper chest rather than down like in your belly so as long as you're able to just breathe and be here pretty passively, it's not a matter of trying to like really crank it far back. Like don't overdo it. Same thing with the head position. You don't have to look far back. Your head can be wherever, you know, is most comfortable for your neck. So this, those types of specifics aren't as important as just keeping the spine straight upright. That's the, the biggest part like that. Uh, one of and it's my, harder than people think. Oh my going. gosh, totally. <laughs> like all this seems pretty basic. You're like, well, yeah, keep the spine up. Okay, head back. But I can't even tell you how many times I say the same thing because people do the same things. And, you know, if you really want to check your own kind of uh, positioning, you can either, you know, film yourself with your camera or have somebody take pictures of you or do it in front of a mirror just so you can see, oh, I didn't know I did that. You know, it's, Again, not judgment, it's just awareness because we don't, if we don't realize we're doing something, then we can't do a course correction on it, you know? Right, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so fun. Yeah. Is, are there, I love twists. I think that they're so critical because, like you said, we don't do them enough. Right. So when I feel like when I, I, I just feel really stiff if I, if I haven't done it. Like, so I do it a few times a week yeah. or whatever. And it's not a huge thing, but it definitely just, I don't know. I feel like it can breathe better. For sure. Um, now, are there other parts of our body that we should be stretching also that you feel like absolutely. are kind of fundamental? Absolutely. So I'm going to lay down for a second. I'm going to make sure. Can you see me okay here? Are we mm -hmm. good? Okay. So one thing that I really love to do too is I'll have my arms open out. And you'll step, you, you'd step your feet. If you're on a, on a yoga mat or a Pilates mat, you'd step your feet to the edges of the mat. But if you're not on a mat and you're just on the floor, then it's just a matter of stepping your feet pretty far apart. And then you'll just take a breath in. And as you exhale, take the legs down to one side. And then you'll inhale back up and exhale down to the other side. So I'm going to keep doing it so you can see. But you'll notice my legs aren't getting all the way to the ground, especially in the beginning. But what this does is it helps stretches the hip flexors, it stretches the low back, it helps open the chest a little bit. It's really passive, but if somebody has knee issues, they can completely change the positioning. They can get on their heels instead of being flat-footed. So it's a matter of sometimes doing the tiniest little tweaks that can really impact the whole experience of the stretch itself. So I, I like doing these a lot. These are something that I would say anybody who's able to do it, do it 
you know, a bit in the morning and a bit at night, you're, it, it'll change everything. I mean, it really helps the hip flexors. Um, same thing with, um, this is another one of my favorites and people who have sciatica, you'll, this is a common stretch that you would get from a physical therapist. So you'd start laying down feet are hip socket distance apart. So are your knees. And then you would just lift one foot up in this case, my right foot. I'm putting my right ankle on my left knee. My right toes are pulled back. And then before I do anything else, I'm going to check my pelvis positioning because sometimes we'll do something wonky through the pelvis, kind of hitch it up. So I want to make sure that my hip bones are level. And then to take it up a notch, then I'd be using the core and bringing the legs in. And I just take my hands to the knees. I know a lot of people are taught to do this, but that tends to make people get really, you know, do weird stuff through their neck. So it's not necessary to take it that to that extent. You can just bring your hands to the legs. And if your hands can't get to the legs, you can always wrap. Um, if you have a yoga strap, you can use a yoga strap. If you don't, it could be a bathrobe sash, a beach towel. It doesn't matter. You don't have to spend any money to get stuff. But just being like, you know, right here like this stretches out the muscles back here, specifically the piriformis right now, which is kind of inside the, the you know, the, the glutes kind of, there's lots of layers of muscles back there. But when we sit so much during the day, this is a muscle gets really tight. So, and something else, if, you know, again, if you feel like taking it up a notch from here, you can rock a little side to side. That changes the stretch feeling a little bit. It may not feel good to some people. Some days it doesn't feel as good to me as other days. So it's the kind of thing. Again, I like to say meet yourself where you're at. So if one day something's like, yeah, it's amazing. And the next day it's not so great. Listen to that day, you know. Um, so that's a, that's a really fantastic um, stretch to do too for, for everybody. And then one last thing would be to use... Um, blankets to do a twist on the floor or in your bed. So I'll show how to do that really quick. Because what I'm what I would be going for in this moment is again starting with my legs up, arms are open and then take my legs down. I can't really see my screen, so can you see my legs okay right now? Okay. Um so a lot of times, you know, my body's pretty flexible because I do this for a living. But a lot of times this is not comfortable for people. So you could use blankets from home. You would just put them between the knees and the ankles. So just make sure the, your whole lower leg is staying on it rather than something being kind of weird. You can use multiple blankets or pillows. It doesn't matter. So they could go between your legs if your hips are tight. You can put them underneath one of the legs if that feels better. The point is to just get in a position so you can relax. Because if you're not relaxing, you're gonna be gripping with those muscles that you're trying to relax. So we use, we use the tools so that your body can go, oh, thank you, let me, let me relax for a minute. So those are a couple of my favorite go-tos that are, are pretty easy for just about everybody to do. That's so awesome. And you also have classes online. Is I do. That right? I do. I teach classes online. I have um, an online wellness company, um, two of them actually. And so, you know, one of them, yeah, I, I teach five times a week in there teaching just this type of a, a class. It's a gentle stretch class. So we sit down, we lay down. That's all we do. That's all we do. And who is that ideal for, would you say? The planet. Every single person, <laughs> I mean, truthfully, you know, as long as, as long as somebody can get up and down off of the floor, even if that means with help, you know, you can have a table nearby or something to help get you up and down or even another person to help you. So it can be a challenge. You know, my mom about six years ago or so had a stroke um, and she lost a lot of mobility, virtually everything on her left side for a long time. She's gained back a lot um, more mobility now on that side. So she'll do some of the movements that I kind of, I kind of create a little recipe for her, a movement recipe, you know, for her. Um, so she'll get up and down off the floor by herself, but she does it with the help of her couch. So she can use her right arm to help her get up. She uses her core strength to scooch her legs, you know, so 
she can still do that on the floor, but she's not just going to be springing up and down as, as easily as like you or I would be doing. So as long as right. someone could get up and down somehow, it could be great for them. So if somebody wanted to check out your classes, where do they go? They would go to todaywellness.com. So it's T-A-D-A-Y, wellness.com. Yeah. Oh, I have some great teachers working with me as well. We do yoga, yoga, meditation, yoga nidra, yin yoga, like all sorts of different types of classes. Um, so it's not just me. There's, there's more people who are there to help everybody and you know different levels because since my classes are so gentle people want some people want a little bit more challenging so you know we have we have kind of a spectrum there that's awesome yeah and then you also do wellness coaching i do i do yeah i have a an ayurvedic wellness coaching program that i offer and so it's one-to-one -one coaching which is really fun because then i can use the principles of ayurveda that i've learned through my ayurvedic education and then customize not just different stretching movements and things for people, but dietary changes, how to use herbs in their life to help with imbalances and things like that, help them sleep better, reduce inflammation, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm.